I'm going to jump in and just say uh, uh, it was such a pleasure to see your show, Scott and Sydney, and to uh, spend some time with it this afternoon. And uh, one of the things that uh, intrigued me um, was the ways in which um, you're really fooling around with um, process and materials and um, and yet I feel like they're um, central to some idea of making art that um, invites us into uh, a, a sort of a big world of um, possibility. Uh, I don't think of art as having a message, but I do think it it's a, um, a triggering device in a way for for kind of rethinking things. We end up coming to it with uh, our own ideas and then they work their way into us. Um, and, and so what, where do I want to start here? I think I want to start asking you, Scott, about the pieces of immense paint on tables and furniture. I, and you wrote a little bit about it in a statement um, where you don't think of them as paintings, but they're about paintings. They're not sculpture. What are they? <laughs> well, that, that's a good question. And I, I, uh, I, I didn't know for a while myself, but I was, I was interested and it happened by accident, actually. I, um, I was gonna start painting again. And um, I didn't know what I wanted to paint. So I thought, well, just go in and mix paint. And uh, if you don't start today, you'll start tomorrow. If you don't start tomorrow, you'll start the next day. But but I, I had developed this material because I wanted to make these paintings on the back of this roll flooring that you could buy at Home Depot which is 12 feet wide and uh, comes in grid patterns, um, which are actually, I guess, copies of tile of sorts. And um, because I'm good with materials, I was able to make um, a silicone-based medium that you can mix oil paint with. So the paint that, that uh, would set up overnight, regardless of the thickness, was part of my vernacular um, before I started. And um, uh, at first they, that, that was an earlier piece. So I would, I would go in and I would not think about the painting, the painting being the product. I would think about the process. It, it's kind of like, like uh, thinking about being in a kitchen, but not thinking about the final meal. So what you do is you just slice and dice and saute, and then you leave. And then the next day you come back and you slice and dice and saute. And um, and you never have to think about the final meal. And uh, so the table started to build up and um, I, I liked them, but I didn't know, I didn't know what it was. And, and, um, uh, after a while, I realized that uh, that I didn't have to make a painting from these things. So th th this is much later. Actually, I, I think this is more of a sculptural piece uh, that you're looking at now, which is, it was during the Iraq war. And, um, and this is called um, As Stones for Building Empires. And I was thinking, I, what I did is I went out and got myself a steak and just mix those colors all day. So those are little piles of paint, but they are about the like size the of a raw. roast beef, you know? Yeah. And I just let the process <clears throat> go, you know, if I had to. I never seen anything see what, like it. Yeah. And anyway, um, I, I, think, I think after, I, I've made these for about 10, uh, 12 years, 10 or 11 years. Hmm. And um, uh, I think I started moving towards um, sculptural pieces, not not just um, the, the other are, are 
just paint, just about paint. And then well, it, uh, make, it, it, gives, it gives me this um, strong sense of paint as a, um, as a layer. As, um, you know, we're used to paint as a, an illusion. But the physicality of it, the layering of it. Yeah. I mean, and then just the sheer density of it. And then just imagining the color that's in it. Um, and then it, yes, on a table, it becomes a visual meal in a sense, but it's also those pieces that look like steak. I mean, it starts to get very visceral, bloody. Um, there's yeah, a theatricality I, 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 to this work that's amazing. I, I remember stepping on a tube of red paint once and having it sort of leap, leap out of the tube's back. And uh, yeah, and it was, you usually don't see that much cadmium red, your expensive cadmium red tube like that. I but. used to grind paint. Um, oh, I decided for a number of years that I was going to make all my paint. And then I realized it's just so much work. That's what you have assistance for. And I didn't have an assistant. So um, anyway, uh, I just, I, I got, but I had an understanding of paint that I never had before because I had filled those tubes up from the back and then crimped the back. Um, and thinking of paint, it's just a, a weight. It, that's the other thing. It's the weight. You don't think yeah. of the weight of a canvas or the weight of paint on a surface when you're looking at a canvas, but you, the, the sense of weight, I think, was amazing. Um, well, the, the, the nice thing about it is that since it dried overnight or set up overnight, regardless of the thickness, I could, I could make a painting uh, not being too careful about things and come in the next day and just change them radically mm. and then do it again and again and again. So the thickness did build up and um, I didn't have to worry about product so much. I thought if I saw it and, I, and it was okay, then I would leave it. And if it wasn't okay, I would just I would change it. And I think a lot, a lot of painters do that. I think uh, I... I don't think things are that uh, uh, concise at the end of the day. And if they are, I think you're a lucky man or a woman. But, um, mm. you know, I'm, I'm kind of a shopper in the studio. If, if uh, you show it to me and I like it, I'll buy it. And if I don't, then you have to keep showing it to me. So, so Sydney, your work seems to be all about process also. Yeah. Um, and the, the surprising thing is to realize it's all phot photographic chemicals. And yet I look at them as paintings. So what are they? Um, <laughs> I don't know, honestly. Um, the the entire pursuit of this direction that I took um, kind of started uh, with this idea of creating ink blots, Rorschach tests. Um, I really loved hearing what other people saw in these pieces when I first started messing around with photographic chemistry. Um, and even before that, before I had found my way into the dark room, I was trying to create um, using flowers and paint and photographing them, these Rorschach tests to see. Um, I was really interested to hear what people's thoughts were and what they saw in them because everyone had a different thought. And I don't think I want to label what they are either. I think to some people, they're paintings, to some people, they're photographs. I think they're very fluid and very open to any type of interpretation. And that's the beauty of it. And those round ones who we just looked at are embroidery, what do you call them? Um, hook They're hoops? embroidery hoops. Yeah. But the circle makes that 
I, you know, it, it's a planet in a way. I, it's a universe. It's micro. It's the telescope, telescope and the microscope. Uh, um, I think the round images are are really powerful. Um, and again, they just slip around. They don't. Yeah, it isn't. It isn't important necessarily. No, it's a painting or a photograph. Or it's something else. So this is really the nature of the show, isn't it? Uh, it goes sort of to the heart of making art at the edges of what we expect to see, and then this shows up. You think of the so the one word that um, came up in reading uh, the statement by Scott, um, and I'm just curious. To think of, to, to, to learn what you have to say, Sydney, is um, even though it was in Scott's statement, I, I want to throw the word metaphor at you. Do you think of these as metaphor? Absolutely. Um, when I when I created these and when I create all my pieces, um, they're all metaphors for many different things. I mean, a lot of them usually just amount to just exploring, you know, the unknown questions, the unanswerable questions about our world and life. And I think that that much comes across, but I don't like to, to say that the metaphors I see in these are far and wide, like what they have to be. And that's why I say I like to keep them open because I'm open to other people's interpretation. And I really enjoy hearing the perspective of what metaphors other people see in these, but I think there's many metaphors in them. Is there, some, is there one that resonates with you? Or is it um, unnecessary um, to even define it? Well, for the for the um, fabric pieces, the circle pieces, it was the it was this metaphor. I was seeing a lot of space and the universe, and that's a whole conversation right now and in the world with um, all the technology that we're producing to get out there and learn more about how vast it is. But um, a lot of it is really my own questioning of life and mortality and again like our own planet and what is even beyond that um so in a, oftentimes in a lot of my artwork i'm really going through those thoughts and those feelings and emotions trying to answer my own questions or come to terms with my own beliefs of what i think the answers are um so it is pretty open but at the same time a lot of these circle pieces really did relate to space yeah, it's fascinating because they're both very beautiful and then there's something stressful about them. There's something ominous about them. There's something <laughs> edgy. There's something, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's really strong work. I really enjoyed the, the, how complicated it is. Um, it didn't seem... Um, decorative or pretty, you know, even though they are. I, I think there's an emotional element to them too. Absolutely. Yeah. So Scott, then you, um, you have a, a couple of pieces in yours where you really took on um, your feelings, let's say that, I sense, uh, the anxiety of living through the Trump years. Yeah, yeah. Even though I only just learned that because I didn't know that this had an original title that would have sent me in that direction. But maybe talk about this, this piece of yours. Uh, you mean the lightning, the lightning bolt? Yeah. Um, the lightning bolt. Um, <laughs> well, I'm, yeah, actually, there's a, there's a kind of personal element in there to the lightning bolt and uh, 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 do I really want to talk about this? I, I had um, in 1991, 
um, I was diagnosed with, with a brain cancer. Oh my and, God. Uh, and I was very lucky. It was, uh, it was like a marble and, uh, and they got it out. I didn't have to go to chemotherapy. Anyway, the, the odd thing was when they were rolling me into the operating room, I, <clears throat> I asked the doc uh, what my chances were. Um, even though they had MRIs. To make a long story short, I felt like it was being hit with lightning and you could either escape it or you couldn't escape it. And so I did a bunch of pieces back when I was doing wax pieces that were dice, but the dice floated on their own particular surface or the, the dots did. <clears throat> and... Um, you know, I feel like that there's this aspect of life that is terribly unpredictable. And this guy, um, this is when I was just going back to painting again. And uh, I had stopped the table pieces because I just couldn't afford to make them anymore. And uh, I didn't know what I wanted to paint. And so this is... This is, is this you? Well, it, I mean, it is. It, it is not not. Well, they're all you. Not, right? not specifically, but but I, you know, here's the guy in the middle of this this chaos that, and he's somewhere else, um, either waiting for it to happen or hoping it doesn't happen. Um, so recall, this is titled "Dark Cloud." Yeah, yeah dark cloud, and so. And then the, there's oh, dark cloud two. Yeah, that's that's for for Donald. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I, you know, I, I, uh, I didn't start to paint until, until late in my life, and I really didn't know what I wanted to paint. And uh, I mean, I, I think I can paint, but I don't know what to paint. So these, these are, these are kind of uh, throwing the dart at, at just at uh, the news coming over the radio every day, which was at the time Donald Trump. You can see the help lit yeah. sort of off to the left and trying to disguise it a little bit. Uh, I needed help, he needed help, we needed help. And, uh, and so that was the curtain pieces. But also I, I, I thought that I didn't want to make a bunch of them. Uh, you know, I just, uh, I uh, I probably could have made a few more, but I, I had done those and I was ready to move on. So here the help is more. Uh, it's, it's a little clearer. A little more. Yeah, this, yeah. this was the second of the two. But I think there are wonderful paintings about painting because I really always, I never bought into painting was flat. Um, once you put a mark, once once you just put a piece up, <laughs> yeah. sure it can be a white canvas. Yeah. It's already an illusion. You know, you're already looking into space, and um, and the curtain of color just yeah. Just I, like I, I I struggle with painting. I mean, you know, a, as a designer, I I kind of fight with myself at times. Um, because I, I wonder about, uh, about design and the sort of correctness of good design and then coming to graphic images that really sort of violate uh, everything I was taught anyway. Well, you're, you mentioned, uh, well, your training was in industrial design and then you found yourself just not working in that area but beginning to make this work that um at first was i always thought your work was sculpture when i first saw it in the 80s but then um i'm really i think these paintings are terrific so you come from another discipline i I, I do come from another discipline and <clears throat> um um, and I even had to teach um, uh, painting and advanced painting at times. And uh, I, I'll tell you, I, I'm a little skeptical of, of, uh, of uh, art schools. 
even though I, I believe in them. But I, I think that problem solving is, um, is very dangerous in advanced painting classes because that's what, the, that's what the student wants you to help them with is correcting a problem. And, and uh, that's when I learned something about my own um, problems was, was their problems, which was, um, you know, how to fix something. But I didn't want them to fix it the way I fixed it or fix it for them. Why, why should they solve problems the way I solve problems? They really have to struggle with their own, even though I might not like the way they solved it. It's, I think art schools are sort of learning to learn. I'm and, with you. Um, in and fact, so, in crits, I just say, we're not going to fix this painting. Yeah, just going to respond to it, All right? Because there's no. Yeah. Well, but but don't don't you think that that you run into that problem all the time in the studio anyway? Which is is I, you know there's a problem with this, or at right. least I think there's a problem with this, and how am I going to go about it? And of course, the easiest way to go about it is is the formal way, and then there's there's the infinite number of other solutions to the problem. That's. And that's your path, so. Well, I, I mean, I just, uh, you know, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm just not so interested in what I know, or what I can do. I'm much more interested in what I don't know. And uh, the last thing I want to do, as, as I'm sure it's the same with you, is you don't want to be bored. You know, mm. so. What do you think, Sydney? I agree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I enjoy exhausting all of their opportunities until I like to go full circle. If I start somewhere and I know the easy answer is here, I'm going to go full circle and try everything out first. Right. Right. Well, then there's the accident. Mm -hmm. I, in some ways, I feel like I make work that courts the accident because that's when it comes alive the thing that I couldn't control. So a solution can be deadly because then you fixed it. It's more interesting when it's not fixed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's funny. I think, oh, I like that. I like that. That's her wall. It, it's stunning. Yeah. You know, the interesting thing about the pieces, Sydney, is that there's, when you look at any of the pieces, there's, there's something that is familiar about them, not specifically at all. And it's, it, it's, it is the metaphor in there. It's, it's I, 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 think, I think the last hundred years, in any way, have shown us similarities um, in science, both in, in scale up and scale down. But, uh, but there's something, there's something unique about every piece, you know, and it's, uh, it's, it's really, really nice that they don't repeat themselves. You know, I think, I think it offers something. I think each one offers something. Yeah, I think um, it's it's really great, actually. I hadn't actually seen them all together like this on a wall. Carl was the one who arranged them. Um, so I just made them in the studio, but um, it's really great to see them all together as a group. I think they all work very well together, but also individually. I also think the combination of small and large opens them up to being far and near. Yeah. So it actually transforms the space of that wall. It's pretty stunning when you stand in front of it. Um, and that and that also that had that feeling for me. Am I looking in a telescope or a microscope? <laughs> and I like that it was either or as was Scott was just saying, you know, um, 
the micro and the macro is, or the, you know, we begin to realize maybe it's fractals. We, we get to realize the pattern doesn't, just continues, you know, there's a sort of infinite pattern from large to small. And we're still here, you know, it's still this universe. Uh, can I ask a question, uh, Sydney? Yes, uh, and Sydney can ask a question of you, and I would yeah. encourage that. Yeah, but I, uh, um, I know you, you were involved in photography. Are these only photographic chemicals? Yeah, um, it's three different types of photographic um, solutions. One, two of them are to develop film and one of them is for color print processing and they are on cyanotype treated fabric. Mm. Have, have you thought about some other chemicals floating around? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, now that I that I have a dark room that offers me a lot more space, uh, there will be a lot more experimentation and there's a very small, but there is a community of people doing works with chemistry, photographic chemistry. So we're kind of all working together to talk more about what chemicals we have experience with. But for the color chemicals, they they are a process. They can be pretty dangerous in the way that you um, can't handle them with your hands. You have to wear a respirator. So mm -hmm. it takes a, little, a bit more research and time before handling them. And my comfortability at this point with um, these chemicals is really great. So I can reproduce work pretty quickly. So I was mentioning to, to uh, Sydney that um, the first synthetic colors were in the, were by Runge. I think his name was Philip Otto Runge and his brother was a painter, but he was experimenting with coal tars and started to make synthetic color which he just he thought it looked like the heavens he thought he was producing color and what he was doing is dropping benzoid and different thinners and I do was just experimenting entirely to um, into the black coal tar and then around the edges like a flower these new colors would show up which led to aniline dyes that led to the textile industry, to the fashion industry, to eventually artist pigments and impressionists were using those colors. So there's a whole tradition of experimenting with color. And, you know, you think that was all done in the 1840s. This is like a whole new set of chemicals. Um, and the universe shows up again. <laughs> quite amazing. And yet you have this um, sense also about your work, Sydney, that has to do, as you began speaking, about life and death and um, big questions. Why does anything exist? Got any answers for us? <laughs> As you work in your alchemical labs and you develop these uh, insights into color and space, let us know when you. <laughs> <laughs> when Maybe you'll find the elixir of life. <clears throat> I'll find it in a bottle of chemicals. <laughs> So Carl, why don't we just open it up to people um, who want to ask questions? Uh, I mean, I don't know how many are um, here, but please, um, are there any questions from folks? Good, let's go. <laughs> Maybe they, what, do they come in with a chat? Uh, in the Q&A on the bottom. Q&A, okay. 
Uh, so a question for Sydney um, from Kimberly McDonald. I'm excited to see this new body of work. Can you talk a little bit how you transitioned mediums from photo photographic paper to fabric and what that process was like? Um, how did I transition? Let's see. Um, I had started the this process with photographic chemistry um, when I lost access to a dark room regularly. So when I graduated um, from University of Hartford, I no longer had access to a dark room. Um, and so I was researching different types of processes that I could do that I didn't need to use a dark room for. So it was really just uh, black and white and I was doing what's called chemograms and I was using honey and putting it on photographic paper outside in sunlight and developing and fixing it. And as the honey washed away slowly, it developed the paper at different times. And I just kept going a little bit further. And like I started to um, get more into color chemistry. I looked into um, color printing and I started making the chemograms small in color and that is a little bit more difficult because um, the chemicals do go on to the paper white you have to wait for them to develop so i had to start learning what mixtures kind of create what colors and that's kind of the the aspect of accident that plays in a lot of my pieces um, i don't actually fully know until it actually develops what it's going to look like because Although the mixture can be exactly the same, there could be different factors. Um, and so when I was in school, I had learned a bunch more experimental techniques and cyanotype was um, one of my favorite because it was very, it was easy. Um, you could do it outside in sunlight to expose and you develop with water. And it wasn't until very recently that I had decided to what would happen if I put color chemistry on top of cyanotype. Um, Cause I'd only ever done it the traditional way. Um, and I just remembered that it was a process that I could do. So I created two seven foot pieces that I hung from the ceiling in a show that I did last October. And those were um, cyanotype treated fabric that I put all of the chemicals on. Um, so for this, show I really wanted to explore that more because I was growing tired and a, a little bit bored of the square pieces that I was creating in paper in the same frames and so I decided to play more with the cyanotype on fabric um, and the embroidery hoops was a 11th hour decision but again I was tired of seeing the, the square I wanted to create a new shape for myself um, and it just kind of popped into my head. So I got a bunch of embroidery hoops. I put them in there and, and that was that. Okay, so the next question you kind of answered, um, why did you choose embroidery hoops just for the shape or were you also thinking of women's work? Um, I wish I can say that I was <laughs> thinking of women's work, but it really was just for the shape. Um, I was, you know, imagining and being inspired by space and planets and things like that. And so um, circular shapes were really the area that I wanted to go to with these specific pieces. Um, I didn't know that embroidered hoops were going to work. I was looking to make my own um, circular frame somehow, but when I found them online, it was very easy. Um, but yeah, it was the, the space aspect and the inspiration there that led me to the hoops. Do you have any questions for uh, Scott, Sydney? Um, I do, yeah. 
So <laughs> Carl was telling me a little bit about your process um, and how you created the, the not sculpture paint pieces. Um, can you talk a little bit more about your material for that? Um, well, I, I mean, the material, uh, I, I was trying to work on the front side of these floor flooring that I got at um, Home Depot. So it was a shiny flooring and, and uh, I knew that um, silicone was, would work on it, but the toxicity of the GE silicone was terrible. And um, um, because I was good with plastics as a designer, I was able to locate uh, a type of silicone that had a, a very long setting time. In other words, it didn't start the skin in the first 15, 20 minutes. It, it took an hour to start the skin. So um, I had to have that made for me. Um, and I had to have it made by the ton, which meant um, 45 gallon pails of it at a time and a big wow. expense. And uh, so it was, it was an ordeal, but, and, and the paintings, uh, I was interested in the paintings, but um, uh, I was, uh, I always, I, I just didn't know whether I wanted to make abstract paintings or representational paintings. So that started the palette. And, um, you know, after the palette got to be about an inch thick, I thought, well, that's interesting. And then I took my daughter's Barbie dolls and put them in there and I hated them the next day. So of course I had to cover them up. So it got another few inches of, <laughs> you know, I think, I think what we do is we look for devices and the devices become very familiar. And um, after it got, mm, oh, I don't know, six or seven inches thick, I, I also put books in it. You know, I, it's, um, I, I think you search for solutions and you use the most obvious solution, certainly in the beginning. And then, uh, then the paint was, was enough for me. I just, um, I was interested in the process. So it was mixed. You have Barbie dolls and books in? Well, in, in, in the first yeah. piece, yes. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. And devices, so these are, um, we're carrying devices around with us all the time now. Yes, we are. And and, sure. and you and Sydney have just created different new devices, much more um, interesting devices. Okay, uh, another question for Sydney. Um, after your fabric is processed with cyanotype, how do you apply the other chemicals and how do you apply and process each step with other chemicals? Um, I apply, first the fabric is um, coated with the cyanotype solution and then that has to dry. Um, this has to be done in the dark as well. Um, and then I go out in the, in the daytime, uh, depending how big the pieces are. Um, I can do it just under lamps as well, but um, the cyanotype Prussian blue will come through better when it's direct UV light from the sun. Um, and then I just start layering the chemicals and placing them where I, where I need to or want to. Um, the three chemical processes that I, that I use are C41, which is a color film developer, um, E6, which is slide film developer, and RA4, which is a color printing chemistry when you actually develop color prints from the dark room. And um, some don't play well with others in the order that you layer them on top of each other. Um, like I said earlier, I, I kind of know what mixtures will produce what types of colors, but it's still a range. Um, so RA4 will produce some blues, E6 will produce browns and warm tones, 
and I have to thoughtfully kind of layer those on top of each other so one doesn't overpower the other and then the whole thing would just turn dark blue or black. Um, and I just kind of slowly work through that. Once it touches the piece, it needs a couple minutes to actually develop. Um, with cyanotype, that was a little bit more difficult because cyanotype is developed in water. So once they're getting wet, it was starting to develop the cyanotype area. Um, and this was the first time, not the first time, but I'm still learning how to use these chemicals in conjunction with cyanotype. Um, so also over time, their colors may change. They may get deeper or more saturated. I have some old pieces of mine um, and their colors change over the years. I think one of my oldest ones is five or six years old and it looks entirely different from the day that I made it. So is that okay? Is it okay that they change? I think so. I think especially with when I'm when I'm making these with these metaphors and answering these questions, I to myself, um, I really enjoy that I have pieces that grow with me um, over time. And I do have pieces that you can stop the chemical reaction when you're done. Um, I've done shows with that. I've sold pieces like that. They will stay the way that they are. But I, I really do enjoy working with pieces that that may change over time. I really enjoy seeing that process. I was just thinking that we're using the same word that Scott was using about talking about um, fixing a painting, meaning and solving a problem, whereas fixing your photographic solution is to stop the change. Actually, yeah. kind of works, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. <laughs> <laughs> uh, both ways. Um, a question for Scott by Calvin Mew. Um, Scott, are you working on something now, um, looking for something different, or thinking about revisiting a previous phase? Um, I, I am working on something now. I'm trying to elevate the social level of the scribble in a, in a, in paint. So the, the scribble is sort of a d diminutive mark. And uh, uh, I think that, uh, I think that not all marks are alike. And I think there's a way to add um, more of an emotional, um, specific emotional content to it. So um, there's, there's small paintings. I, I'm, I've just uh, stopped making large pieces. It doesn't make any, any sense for me anymore. But um, so I'm, the large, I'm, uh, large painting doesn't make any sense. How come? No, no, because um, you know you, yeah. what, what, where are they going to go? What, what are you going to do with them after a while? Decide so roll them up, and um, uh, I. Uh, Anyway, that's that's what I'm doing right now. Although I have terrible ADD, and and things can change pretty quickly, which I allow myself. So, thanks for that question, Calvin. I, I want you to know I set him up for that question. <laughs> and I want to thank. Um, Kimberly for her question. And it's nice to have, did you, Kimberly, and did you go to school at the same time, Sydney? So you got, okay. I lose track of who went through <laughs> when. So I think, um, you know, it's just an amazing show. I love the fact that it's on the edge of everything. You know, it's on the edge of illusion what an object is, what's, you know, how we're using this chemical space. I mean, um, fascinating. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's an inspiring show. I really enjoyed it. Uh, unpredictable. And also Pam's work 
and it's sad that she is not with us. But that's a whole other thing. Um, well, Carl, I think we're at an end here, unless there's more questions. Uh, I do not see any more. Um, so, okay, a big thank you to our panelists tonight. Special thank you to Power for moderating. Um, thanks, Power. No, oh, thanks. Thanks, Scott. Let's all be in depth, Scott. <laughs> I'll I'll uh, I'll I'll call you for that coffee and we can. Okay, I know how to get you through Carl. So, and Sydney will be in touch. So great, excellent work. It's great to see it. And thanks for your thanks. Wonderful conversation. Yeah. Your openness to to your process. Uh, so all of these exhibitions are up through November sixth, along with Pamela Stockmore's. Uh, a retrospective exhibition. Um, Five Points Gallery is open Tuesdays through Saturday, 11 a.m. to 5 p.m., Sundays 1 to 5 p.m., and by appointment. Um, I also urge you to check out our website for other opportunities, such as the various workshops, memberships, and rentals at the Five Points Art Center. Um, and thank you all for joining us tonight. And that's a wrap. Thanks, Carl. Thank okay. you. Thanks.